Okay. Good morning and thank you for joining us. I'm Sharon Metro. I'm the Director of Development at Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School. I'm happy to see you all and thank you for joining us. We have a great program today and we're so pleased to have Mark Levine share with us about how we can all include charitable giving in our estate planning. The reason we're presenting this program in particular is because it's for everybody. You don't have to have a huge estate or complicated documents. Mark is going to walk us through how to make charitable giving really simple. Um, a few, just a few housekeeping things. I'm going to introduce in a moment um, our a few of our pre speakers who will just take a few minutes to to set things up. Um, please use the Q and A function in your um, on your Zoom so that you can um, you can type questions in there, and Mark will either answer them as we go or answer them after he speaks, depending on depending on the topic. Um, so right after um, right after me, Mitch Malkus, who was our Rabbi Mitchell Malkus, who was our head of school, is going to talk for a few minutes and, and bring you up to date on a few exciting things that are happening at JDS. And then Mitch is going to turn the um, webinar to Arielle Lavenbuck, who is a very involved parent at our school. Arielle is on our board and he's our development board chair. He's the proud dad of two JDS students. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mitch Malkus. Hi, I realized I, was, I must have gotten muted when I came back. Um, Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks Sharon for um, hosting. And uh, I also want to uh, share my thanks to Mark uh, for joining us today and really for the presentation. Uh, Mark, you've done a number of presentations to our community and we're really fortunate to have you in, in our community, uh, both as a parent and an expert in this area. Um, so Sharon mentioned, I was just going to share very briefly some information and news, uh, exciting things that are going on at JDS currently. Uh, the first thing I want to share is we learned just last week that uh, 65 JDS students uh, qualified for the global um, seal of biliteracy, which means that they are fluent in more than one language, in our case, uh, English and in Hebrew, and we're super excited about this. Uh, it really shows the excellence of the Hebrew program at the school, and the, uh, the global seal is given based on a test by uh, Avant, and that test is based on um, standards by the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. So um, it's, it's a real tribute to our teachers at the school and particularly to the students for their excellence in, in Hebrew. Uh, a quick look of all the students, we see that JDS has more students than any other school who qualified for this uh, seal of excellence. Um, second thing I want to share is, is that we're having a lot of wonderful events, uh, some uh, in person these days. Uh, last week we had the upper school winter concert where our middle school ensemble, uh, choir, our high school ensemble, uh, choir, and two of our a cappella groups were able to perform. It was a really wonderful celebration of the arts at JDS, and um, it's the first of a number of different things that we're doing in the arts that are going to be live. Our middle school uh, Shakespeare Club is putting on a performance of Twelfth Night uh, coming up very shortly, and uh, that's part of their study of Shakespeare, and, and this year their uh, performance will be Twelfth Night. Uh, this uh, past, past Mosei Shabbat on Saturday evening, we were able to celebrate uh, the Sarah and Samuel J. Lessons uh, fourth grade Havdalah ceremony. It was a really exciting evening. Uh, this was the first time in over a year that we were able to have the Havdalah celebration in person. It was hosted at B'nai Israel Congregation. Um, was really a, an opportunity for our community to come together and our fourth graders to share uh, about what they've learned and also about their ability to leave the Havdalah uh, ceremony. 
we also have some exciting things going on in our middle school, which is a, a very innovative part of our program. Uh, we have something called Innovation Mini Mester. Uh, just between the first semester and the second semester, our students have about 10 days in which they can engage in an area that they choose that they're passionate about. Um, they do research, they work on different projects, and then they have an opportunity to present uh, to their classmates in, in school. And we call that Innovation mini Master. And the idea originally started um, in sort of looking at what Google does with its employees, where it gives a certain percentage of their time to the employees, no matter what they do to engage in a passion project. And uh, we developed something called the Innovation mini Master, which our students really like, and it's now a signature part of our program. Last area I want to share with you today is, is that our senior students, our 12th graders, uh, had their last day of school on Friday. We had a special uh, cob shop for them. And uh, now they're going to be going into what we call the Zeitelman Senior Seminars. It's a chance for them to start to prepare for college and after JDS. Uh, we do uh, seminars on a number of different areas. And just to give you a sense of some of the things that they're going to be discussing, uh, they have a seminar on navigating conversations about Israel on campus. Uh, they have uh, a seminar on drugs and alcohol on campus. They have a seminar on financial literacy. They have a seminar on healthy relationships and consent within relationships. Uh, and they have uh, another seminar on sex education. Uh, last, they end with a panel from recent uh, JDS alums who will share what college life is like and some tips to prepare to be successful in college. So we're super excited about the Zeitelman Senior Seminars. It's really a way for our students to prepare outside of the academic program for life after JDS. Um, so at this point, I'm going to pass it along to Ariel, uh, who I believe is going to introduce Mark. Thanks, Dr. Um, good morning, everyone. As Sharon said, my name is Ariel Lavenbuck. I'm a member of JDS's board and its chair of development. My wife, Jennifer, and I have two children at the school in third and fifth grade. We're also members of JDS's Boneme Society. The Bonim Society comprises supporters of JDS who've decided to make a planned gift to the school. Although our family gives to JDS each year as part of its annual Mayan campaign, my wife and I see a unique and important role for planned giving as well. Our annual contributions help the school and the students who attend it right now. Our planned gift, in contrast, reflects our desire that Jewish education at JDS flourishes long after our own children have graduated. Both things are important to us, and so I hope you too will consider making JDS a part of your estate planning. It's a critical part of sustaining the Jewish community for our own grandchildren and children. As Sharon said, plan giving is much easier to do than you might think, which I hope is something you come away from today's seminar understanding. Uh, in my family's case, we made JDS a beneficiary of our HSA account, which took just five minutes and two signatures on a single piece of paper. And so with that, I want to introduce Mark Levine, who I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for over a decade. Mark is a partner at Handler and Levine, where he assists individuals and families in preparing estate plans, including wills and trusts. He has a BS from Boston University and a JD from George Washington University, and he lectures regularly on the topics he'll be covering today. And most importantly, he is a JDS parent. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Ariel said, I am a JDS parent. I have uh, three kids, two of whom uh, went all the way through JDS. I have a senior in college, a sophomore in college, and a sophomore in high school. Uh, so it's it's been a big part of, of our life and a big part of our kids' lives and our family lives for a long time now, and uh, at least for you know the next two years actively as a parent in the school. Um, we're gonna talk this morning about estate planning and gifting. Uh, and the idea really is not to go into sort of all of the mechanics of it, all of the, the detail of it, but just to talk about how people give, how you can give, how it is going to be far easier for you to give than you may think. Um, you know, I'll talk for a minute about the majority of people that I work with. Um, they are or were federal workers, government contractors, professionals like doctors, dentists, uh, attorneys. Uh, they've done well, they're doing well. Uh, they, you know, have money to, you know, have a comfortable life and they have money that they want to give uh, and to do charitable giving. 
um, historically, you know, families with, with younger kids, with kids even in their, you know, sort of what I call the, the young adult uh, challenge uh, of the kids, you know, th they're focused on estate planning for their kids. They're focused on estate planning to take care of, make sure they've got things to take care of themselves, make sure they have things to take care of their kids. Um, but as people start to get more comfortable, that's when I find that more and more clients are receptive to the conversation about charitable giving. It's a conversation that we have with every client and every you know sit down that we have with them, but it is uh, something that I find that as people get more comfortable in their lives, they get more comfortable with the idea that, that they can do this thing that they've always wanted to do, which is give and still be comfortable for themselves and be comfortable for their kids. So what we're gonna talk about this morning are really the most popular charitable giving techniques in the estate planning that I do with my clients. Uh, we're gonna go over outright gifts. Uh, that's the easiest in some ways. Beneficiary designations, as Ariel mentioned uh, with the HSA, our beneficiary designations are probably the simplest, quickest way to make a planned charitable gift. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about designations through wills and trusts. That requires slightly more work if you're doing it from scratch and not much extra work if you're doing it as part of your estate planning with your estate planning attorney. It's something that your estate planning attorney will know how to do. They'll be able to answer specific questions about specific charities. Uh, or specific ways to leave money in your estate planning documents. So it really can be very straightforward, uh, but we'll talk more about that. Um, we're going to talk about gifts through life insurance ownership. Uh, so you can sort of transfer ownership of life insurance policy. We'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about donor advised funds and, and how they work uh, and why I think they're becoming more popular with people as time goes on. Uh, we're going to talk about charitable remainder trusts, because those are also becoming more of an issue and more of something that, that we've been doing, uh, specifically recently, although not, I'm thinking none of my clients are that anxious this month, uh, but with crypto, we've done several uh, charitable remainder trusts where uh, cryptocurrency was what was donated. Uh, and the last thing we'll talk about, well, actually not the last thing, we'll talk about endowment agreements. Uh, so giving that has a plan attached to it, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about private foundations uh, and why most people, although they may talk about them, end up not doing it. So we're going to talk first about the outright gifts. Um, and I'll say this, you know, we've got the, the Q&A open and I'll be glancing at it. And if there's something that comes up while we're talking about the particular thing, please don't hesitate to put it in there. Uh, it's more interesting to hear me answer questions, I think, than to hear me talk at you for the next hour. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is sort of the outright gifts, and, and the easiest is the beneficiary designations. Uh, there's an IRA there that you have. There's a um, 401k, a 403b. Uh, you've got your HSA, perhaps. You have your life insurance. If you work for the government, you've got the thrift savings plan and the Fegley life insurance. Uh, all of these things are basically contracts between you and an entity, a life insurance company, an employer, an IRA custodian where you and they agree that they're going to give, they're gonna have this asset titled in your name and they're gonna give it to the, the person who is, that, that you name in this beneficiary designation. Um, if you don't name someone at all, there's a default. That default is normally not what you want, especially if it's an IRA, 401k, 403b, any sort of deferred uh, asset. Uh, and it's really easy to just say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do 45% to one kid and 45% to another kid and 10% to the charity. Um, there are details involved with that. There are things that have to happen after you're gone to make sure that works as efficiently as possible, but it's really easy to do the front end of that, to simply say, this is what we want to do. And this happens a lot. Clients will come in and they will have very complicated charts and they'll have very complicated ideas about how to transfer money and they want to make sure you know that this percentage or they'll give this property or that property. And very often the solution, when we sort of break down, what is it you're trying to do? Oh, well, at the end of the day, I wanna give 10% to charity. And I thought it could come from here and here and here. And the easiest thing really is just to do it from your beneficiary designation. Uh, beneficiary designations, the, the one downside is that you can almost never do amounts. You have to do percentages. So you have to do 5% or 10% uh, or 20% or 30%. Uh, so that does mean you've got to go back. You've got to look at them occasionally and say, hey, does this still fit what I want? Uh, sometimes what clients will do is combine them. 
So it will be 10% of my IRA. Uh, and then in their estate planning, we'll say, but if that isn't X amount, then we'll make it up from somewhere else. So sometimes you've got to coordinate between the two. But again, it's really straightforward to just say, hey, I want to give 10% of my IRA or 10% of my life insurance, which is usually going to be an exact amount to this charity. Similarly, in wills and trusts, it gets more complicated sometimes. People have different formulas, they have different ideas in their own head about what's important to them. And certainly with the wills and trusts, the designations from there, you get a little more control over what you want something to be. The beneficiary designations really aren't going to enforce your wishes. So if you want a particular fund named or you want a particular purpose, sometimes the beneficiary designations are hard to do that. And we'll talk about ways to combine those uh, as we go on. But in your will or in your trust, it's very easy to say, I want this amount to this charity to fund a particular fund that's already in existence, which is the easiest thing to do, or to create something or to put a name on something that you would want, or simply to say in honor of you know, this person or that person. So wills and trusts give you a little more flexibility to say, this is what I want it to be for, uh, as opposed to the beneficiary designations, which if you don't do more planning, it's a little harder to have it go directly or exactly to something that you want other than the organization as a whole. Uh, so again, those are really easy for general gifts to general organizations. Uh, you need a little more work if you're going to be trying to specify how and, and where it goes to somebody. Uh, wills are public. Anyone can look and see you know, what you had and who you left it to and who you didn't leave it to. So if privacy is important to you, you may not want to do your gifting through a will. Uh, you may want to do it through the beneficiary designations. You may want to do it through a revocable trust. Uh, those are both private. Those are both things that no one else publicly is going to see uh, who you left it to or who you didn't. So if privacy is important, those are two that are, are much better options than the will, which is going to be public for everybody to see. Uh, so we're going to talk a little more about wills and trusts and beneficiary designations as we talk about these other ways of transferring things. But it's, it's really very straightforward, very common, uh, and certainly the way that most people start. Uh, most people start their estate planning when they're younger saying, well, if my kids aren't here, then I'll give this to charity. Uh, and they evolve to saying, well, even if my kids are here, I'm going to give this to them and this to charity. And as time goes on, that percentage may change. Again, as they feel their, their kids are more and more comfortable, they're more and more comfortable making those gifts. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one particular kind of beneficiary designated asset here, which is uh, the life insurance. Uh, the life insurance can be done through uh, a change in, in ownership as well as a beneficiary designation. Uh, so you can donate the, the life insurance policy by donating the ownership of it. So life insurance has two parts. It has the ownership and it has the beneficiary. Uh, unlike an IRA, which you cannot transfer or, or donate during your life directly like that, life insurance you can. Uh, and sometimes that is a beneficial arrangement. Sometimes there are ways in terms of the cash value of the policy or just the fact that perhaps it's a policy that you want to have someone else administer, you don't want to have to worry about it anymore and it has value, uh, that can be worked on to sort of move it to, to where you want it to go. Um, I do want to go back for a second and talk about the beneficiary designations, the IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and talk about another reason why we sort of prefer that if we can. Uh, and that's because of the taxes. Uh, your, your, the, the, the receipt of an inheritance by your family is not income to them. Uh, there may be estate taxes involved. In some situations, there may be inheritance taxes involved, uh, but there's not going to be income involved. Uh, but the receipt of your IRA by your children is subject to income tax. So under the new SECURE Act rules, which came into effect in 2020, when you leave your IRA to your child, they have 10 years from the date of your death to use or take out or withdraw all of the money from the IRA. And as they do that, it is ordinary income to them. Uh, so they can take it out 10% a year. They can take it out 50% the first year and 50% at the end of 10 years. 
uh, they can wait entirely to the end to take it out. But whenever they take it out, it's 100% income to them. Uh, so leaving a child $300,000 in life insurance and $300,000 in an IRA is not necessarily the same thing. It's not the same value because the life insurance comes without income taxes. The IRA comes with income taxes. Uh, so it's something that when we're looking at where does the money come from, one of the reasons why we focus on IRAs and 401ks and, and those sorts of things is because that deferred income tax we can get out of. When it goes to the charity, the charity takes that 300,000 or that 100,000 or whatever it is you're leaving them and they don't have to pay income tax on it. So you get the full benefit of that money. So if you're looking at which asset goes where, that's again, a big part of what we do. We talked about people coming in with sort of complicated ideas and we simplify it, make it easier to go directly somewhere, but we also make it more efficient uh, by putting the, uh, the, the deferred income tax asset to the charity and putting the non-income tax asset to the child, you have not only made it more efficient for the child, but you've made it more efficient for the charity as well. So it's really important to be looking at that. Uh, again, the receipt is not income for uh, of an inheritance, it's not income unless it's one of these deferred assets, uh, deferred income tax assets. So that's something that you wanna be looking at along with the ease of doing it is the benefit uh, income tax wise, both to yourself and to the kids. Uh, so the life insurance option, uh, is more complicated and probably something you have to coordinate with the recipient organization. I know that um, JDS has an agreement to work through Federation for these kinds of gifts. Uh, and it's a little more complicated for them to own and, and continue the life insurance policy. On the other hand, it can be a great uh, benefit and a lot of leverage in terms of the amount of money you give. All of life insurance is this sort of idea of leverage where you're paying a certain amount here and getting a benefit down the road. Um, so that's something that you can look at as well. If you're interested in finding other ways to give, uh, that's a way that, that I know uh, some people have been looking at and, and using recently. And I'm sure Sharon can, can talk more about that if she, uh, when we have a moment. Um, another thing that, that clients are doing a lot of, and what I'm finding when people come in is they already have set up donor advised funds. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, financial advisors uh, have done a good job of is talking to clients about charitable giving themselves uh, and setting up these donor advised funds. And what a donor advised fund is essentially taking some money. Let's start with what you do while you're alive, taking money and putting it in this donor advised fund. And you make the charitable gift when you put the money in the fund. And then a certain amount of that has to be distributed out every year. Um, so it, it's a great way to give the money now, especially if there's an income tax reason to try and get more out in a, in a particular year, uh, as well as to retain control of the money and where it goes. Uh, it's a thing that I've noticed a lot of clients and we've talked about and they've put into place that the, it's the thing they start using to help their kids understand about gifting. Uh, there's an advisor for the donor advice fund. Once you make the gift, it is no longer your money. Uh, it's no longer strictly under your control. You're an advisor. You advise where you want it to go. Uh, and the person holding it, whether it's Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity or Merrill Lynch or Edward Jones or Morgan Stanley, they are the ones who make the distribution. They all have donor advised funds of some kind. Uh, the limitations on that, it's got to go to a 501c3 uh, uh, entity. Um, so I've had some clients where the kids have, have had some frustration because they want to give it to a uh, nonprofit, lo local uh, nonprofit, um, local sports team or, or that they're involved in or something like that. Uh, and so that's something that you may not be able to do. So while you don't lose a lot of control over it, you may lose some. Um, and Sharon's telling me that the uh, Federation has donor advised funds as well, which is not surprising. Um, and, and something that people can look at specifically through Federation to do. Uh, but what people are doing is they're setting these things up and they're working with their kids. They're saying, hey, you're going to pick the charity, you know, figure out what you want, what's important to you, uh, and then we'll advise them to go ahead and do it. And they're making their kids the sort of 
subsequent advisors. So mom and dad are the advisor while they're alive, but at their death, the kids are gonna be in charge of distributing money from the donor advised fund. Uh, and so it's also someplace that money can go at death. So you usually create it while you're alive, you're funding it while you're alive, there are income tax benefits while you're alive, but it's also someplace for the money to go at death. And one of the benefits there is, you know, rather than have to come up with sort of a complicated idea of where you want things to go and for what, you can defer that, that conversation sometimes. You can say, you know, look, we're, we want our kids, I've had this happen a lot, well, we'll give it to our kids, we'll let them give it away. Uh, and that's fine if your goal is really just to give it to the kids uh, and let them decide whether or not they're going to give it away. But if you really want it to go away, if you really want it to be given to, to charities, the donor advised fund is really a great opportunity to give the money someplace where the kids are gonna be the ones giving it away, but they're gonna to have to give it away. It's not something that they can put off or choose not to, or think that maybe they should or shouldn't. If it's important to you, but you still wanna defer some of the decision-making to uh, your family down the road, that's a, a great way to do it because you're able to put the money in there and let them go ahead and make decisions later about how they distribute it out. So I'm finding a lot of clients coming in with very small donor advised funds now. Uh, I think you can start them with five or 10 or 15 or 25,000 uh, because they wanna start the process now. They wanna get in the habit of doing it. They wanna involve their kids in it. Even if it's small amounts, it, it's really important to them to make that a, a family value, something that they're going to, to do. Uh, so it's just, a, it's a really good and more popular way to do things. Uh, Deferred gifts at death. So one of the other issues uh, with uh, gifting is that when you make a gift during life, uh, you are giving a, an asset to somebody. And if there's a, a low cost basis, they're taking it at your cost basis. So if you have Exxon that you bought at a dollar a share and you give it to your child when it's worth $50 a share, their basis is a dollar. And when they sell it, even after your death, it's going to be subject to capital gains because their basis is so low. So one of the things that people do when they've got a lot of low basis assets is they look for ways to make that into something that they can use now or their kids can use later uh, by using what we'll call a charitable, well, what's called a charitable remainder trust. And what a charitable remainder trust does is it allows you to take that asset now put it into the trust so that eventually it's going to go to the charity if it's a charitable remainder trust. Uh, but during your life, uh, it can be, it turns into a stream of income that comes to you. So most recently, uh, at the end of last year, we did a number of these with cryptocurrency. And one of the issues with crypto is it is not considered um, currency, it's considered an asset, it's considered property. So it is subject to all of these capital gains rules uh, the same way a painting would be or a stock would be. Uh, and so if you bought crypto five years ago or 10 years ago and it's increased in value, uh, even compared to what's been happening in the last week or so, you've got all of this money, uh, but every time you use it, it's going to be subject to capital gains tax. And so what we've done with a couple of clients at the end of last year was they took a significant position in crypto uh, and they moved it into the charitable remainder trust. And what they get back is a stream of income, somewhere between uh, you know, five and 50%, although usually much closer to the five than the 50, uh, they take it back over a period of time. So one client put in a couple of million dollars of crypto, it's taking back a stream of income 5% per year uh, back to him. So he's turned what is a, a hard asset to sell into a stream of income for him over the next 20 years. Uh, you don't want to do that with something that you might need to use. So if you have money that you use regularly to, you know, buy things or for your own upkeep or for gifting, or, or if it produces dividends that you use for your life, that may not work out. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people have these low basis assets. Before crypto, there were and our stocks, there's real estate. There's lots of things that you can't really sell because the capital gains hit would be too significant. And if you're not seeing income off of them, then the charitable remainder trust is a great way to take that asset now, 
put it into the charity, charitable remainder trust for the trust, the, the charity later, and to get a stream of income off of it now. So those are things that we look at with lots of different assets. Uh, different assets have different issues. So one of the issues with crypto is valuing it, uh, which is a more complicated thing than valuing stock or valuing a piece of property, uh, which are sort of, we all have, have an idea of how to do that. IRS has agreed that if you do it this way, we'll follow it. IRS is, is pretty squirmy when it comes to anything having to do with crypto. Uh, and so valuing it's more complicated uh, as opposed to a house or a painting or, or something like that. So charitable remainder trusts are really a good tool while you're alive. Um, they're also something that I've had clients do at death uh, when there's going to be an estate tax, especially moving money into the charitable remainder trust is going to help you with the income, with the estate tax at death. And it's going to provide a stream of income to the kids. Uh, so occasionally we have clients who, you know, not sure they really want to leave a lump sum to a child, but like the idea of the sort of testamentary charitable remainder trust, because at their death, it turns into a stream of income for the child. Uh, and that's something that's attractive if they're concerned about how they're going to use the money, what they're going to do with it, having access to it uh, outright. Another option there is trust, but trusts require a trustee. Trusts require other costs. Trusts also come often with friction among family, especially if one child is subject to a trust and another child isn't, you're going to have sort of direct friction among the kids. If one child is receiving a stream of payments, they may not be thrilled with it, but it's not as direct a comparison to what the, the other kids might be getting, uh, especially if the other kids are going to be the people in charge, if you want them to be executors or trustees, taking them out of that role overseeing their siblings' money is, is something that is worth looking at. And so using these testamentary trusts is a way to look at doing that as well. Um, let's see. So we we'll talk a little bit about uh, charitable foundations. Um, a lot of people come in and they want to talk about a foundation. They want to talk about, you know, at our death, we want to leave something and here are the things we want to leave them to and here are the things we want to do. Uh, foundations are seldom carried out uh, because the fact is, in order to do a foundation, you have to create an entire entity. You have to do a application to the federal government. You have to do a five-year budget. You have to have a board of directors. You have to have people who are going to run it and are going to run it in a way where it doesn't run afoul of all of the rules. So the people that are close to you, the people that are in your family who you might want to be involved with this are exactly the people for whom this is the hardest to do. So for a lot of people, the idea of the foundation is not really, it's, it's attractive because you get to create this thing and you get to sort of have people direct it, uh, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to create. It's a lot of work to sort of work through as you are preparing it or, or working with your attorney to sort of figure out what are the rules you're gonna want uh, and it may not be worth it. Uh, so, you know, we've done several, several of them have worked out pretty well. Uh, several of them have sort of not because of all of the problems the family has and they sort of then look at ways to sort of get out of it. Um, so a lot of people think this is something that they're going to want to do or look at or be a part of, and it's not necessarily something that's going to make sense. Uh, what may make more sense when you want that control, when you want that idea of where something's going, is some sort of gift agreement or endowment agreement. So this is where we take the beneficiary designated asset or the asset under the uh, will or the trust, and we tie it together with what you really want to accomplish with the particular organization. Uh, so this happens a lot with colleges uh, where someone will say, look, I want to leave a million dollars to my college, but I really want to have some control over what they do with it. I don't want it going to the building fund. I don't want it going here. Um, I have a client who's really passionate about uh, you know, occupational uh, health and safety. Uh, and so her school that she went to that she's involved with has a lot of sort of lower level programs and she wants to beef it up. She wants to make it important. So for her, uh, it was really important that it go into that particular program. Uh, and so what we did with the school was go to them and say, look, we have a donor who wants to do this. Can we come up with an agreement as to what will happen when you receive the money? Uh, and basically these can come in a lot of different flavors. They can come as obligations. You're going to leave the money. 
Um, they can come as just sort of, if the money is left, this is what we agree we'll do with it. Uh, and if it's X amount of money. So if you say, look, I'm gonna leave at least a million dollars, they're gonna sit down and talk about, you know, what the program's gonna be called, which they'll be very happy to talk to you about. They're gonna talk about administrative expenses sometimes. They're gonna talk about what happens if it's no longer feasible, if the area of, of education or something like that is just no longer there. Uh, what can we do with the money? What can't we do with the money? Uh, and they're going to really work with you to make that program be what you want it to be. So that's done all the way from sort of big universities to smaller organizations to organizations in between. And a lot of times with, uh, you know, synagogues and, and Jewish day school and places like that, we're really looking at endowment agreements. You're creating an endowment uh, where instead of saying, I'm just giving you money to offset whatever expenses you have, I want to do this. And so there's going to be an agreement that says, okay, you're going to give us this money, uh, and this is what we're going to do with it. And there's, you know, a, a, a plan that says if the money goes there. Now, if it's commitment, you've got to come up with the money, and you have to make sure your estate planning deals with that. So again, we may say, look, we're going to leave you everything in the IRA, which right now is, you know, $2 million. But there's no way to know when the person dies what that IRA will necessarily be. So we've got to set up in the rest of their estate planning to say, if this doesn't reach a million dollars, we're going to make it up with other assets here. So that combined, we make sure that that commitment is met. Sometimes clients say, look, they're going to get whatever's left in my IRA. Uh, and so if I use it all, then I use it all. Uh, and so the agreement will be very different. It will say, look, if you get money, this is what you'll do with it. And if you get a million, this is what you'll do. But if you only end up with 25,000, you don't have to do any of it. And again, you can work through what you want that to look like and what level of commitment you're making at your death. Obviously, if you're making an endowment agreement for what you're doing during your life, that's a different issue. You're, you're really saying, I'm committing to giving you this money. And the estate planning part of it comes in by making sure your estate planning is set up to continue or finish that gift. Uh, to make sure that that's going to get done the way that you want it to get done. Um, questions so far? I don't see any questions so far, uh, but if you have any, please don't hesitate to put them in. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about there are, again, the, the income tax, the uh, capital gains tax issues of gifting, uh, and both of those can be really significantly addressed through charitable giving. Uh, there's also the estate tax part. The way estate taxes are set up right now, uh, there are state level estate tax and there are federal estate taxes. Uh, and I know that last fall, there was a lot of talk and consternation and people were sure that the estate tax was going to be cut in half or go down to you know, what it was before you know, 2012 or, or even earlier. Uh, and while I didn't share that panic because I, I don't find that those things normally come to pass, uh, the truth is, I do think the federal estate tax exemption is going to come down. <clears throat> uh, it is currently $12,060,000 per person, uh, and you can use portability if you're married to combine that. So right now, you can leave $24 million plus to your kids without paying any federal estate tax. If you live in Maryland, estate tax levels are about $5 million a person. They are $5 million. They don't change. They do have the portability. DC, it's a lower amount. It's, it's a little over 4 million without portability. Virginia has no estate tax at all. Uh, at the end of 2025, the federal estate tax is probably going to get cut in half. It's going to go from that 12 million number, let's say at that point it is 13 million, and it's going to get cut in half per person. So it's going to be 6.5 million rather than 13 million. Uh, and for some people, that's going to trigger sort of a more significant estate tax problem. Uh, and, you know, what you give to charity at your death is deducted from your estate. Uh, so if, uh, if you have $12 million or $13 million and you give it all to charity, you've got a $13 million gross estate and you have a zero net estate. There's going to be no estate taxes paid at all because everything going to the charity is deducted from the gross estate. So charitable giving really does have an impact at life and at death in dealing with uh, income taxes, dealing with uh, capital gains taxes, and dealing with estate taxes. There are ways in all of that uh, to, to really blunt some of that. Um, 
I think you know Sharon was just mentioning in here, uh, when we set up endowments at JDS, they're permanent. So again, when we talk about the name, when you set up a, an endowment agreement, uh, you're saying this is what it's gonna be called. And it's what it's gonna be called forever because the point of the endowment is that the money is going to last. You're gonna put the money in a fund and they're going to use the income from that in order to carry out what it is that you want to accomplish with it. Uh, and so whatever the name is, whatever, whether it's your children you want to honor or your parents you want to honor uh, or your family as a whole, it does have the name usually on it for what you want to do, uh, which is a nice way to sort of make that something that is permanent in your, in your family uh, and something that your kids and your grandkids and their kids uh, can look at years down the line to say, you know, this is something that my family has been a part of for this entire uh, time. Uh, I know when I go to Beth uh, in the in the hallway where all the old plaques are from the old shul, I can look in there and see my grandfather's plaque uh, from when he was honored at Beth Shalom in DC, uh, and it was all taken out there. And that's a nice piece of continuity for me and my family to look at and know, you know, that he was a part of that. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a new agreement with JNF where endowments for the Israel trip scholarships will be matched, doubled by JNF uh, for the uh, Israel trip, trip for the seniors, which is great. Um, and that, that's a really great thing uh, as well. Uh, let's see, there is a queue. There's a question. What happens if you endow money to an organization that no longer exists at the time of your death? So that's a good question. That is definitely part of the estate planning. Uh, so if you're doing it through your trust or your will, there's going to be language in there that says, hey, if this organization doesn't exist, what do we do with it? So very often there is a successor organization, someone who sort of took over organizations that merged, and the money usually will flow there. If they really no longer exist and there isn't specific language about what to do with it. Usually the executor or trustee is charged with finding something that is similar to what it is that you were, you were trying to accomplish with that gift. Uh, so it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen where, where we have to find some other similar charity. And sometimes you're required to petition the court to do that, sometimes not, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, but that is something that you, you know, you, you want to prepare for in your estate planning. And, and it's a good question to ask your estate planning attorney, how are we set up to deal with that in that situation? Um, okay. Let's see, Sharon, I was just saying, obviously people should ask you a few questions afterwards. So if there are questions that you don't necessarily want put into a chat or a Q and A or something like that, um, you know, feel free to, to email me later or, or call later. I'm happy to try and answer your question. Uh, call Sharon because I know she's happy to answer your questions about any of this as well. Um, other questions so far for anyone? Um, in sort of everyday gifting now, uh, you know, there are different ways that you make gifts that do or don't count for your gift or estate tax issues. So one of the myths people have is there's some sort of limitation you're allowed to, limitation on the amount you're allowed to gift to people uh, or to charities, and there's not. There's a limitation on the amount you're allowed to give to someone without telling IRS that you did it. Uh, and so if you give more than $16,000 in a calendar year to somebody, you're required to tell IRS that you made that gift. One of the big exceptions though is tuition. Uh, you can pay tuition for anyone, not just children or grandchildren, uh, directly to the educational institution and it's not considered a gift. And so if that tuition is $5,000 or $10,000 or $25,000 or $50,000, it doesn't matter. That tuition payment is not counted as something that you gave. <clears throat> it's not counted as part of your estate for estate tax purposes. Um, it is basically uh, just money that you have gifted for the benefit of that person who you're paying the tuition for. Uh, and so obviously that's something that is available at JDS to do. Um, and it's available really for anyone, whether it's a child, a grandchild, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can pay anyone's tuition as long as you pay it directly to the educational institution. Uh, so you can't give the money to someone and have them pay it. 
you have to pay it directly. Um, let's see. Uh, can you please share Mark's email address in the chat? So I'll, I'll let uh, Sharon do that. Um, any qualified account, any anything that's qualified can be used to fund the charitable remainder trust, but the qualified accounts really can only be used at death. Um, so you can't take your IRA or other qualified asset today and put it into a charitable remainder trust. That's only something that can be done at death. Uh, so that is, that's, that's really the difference between the kind of asset you're going to use to fund a charitable remainder trust is during your life, you're going to use these low basis assets like real estate and stocks and crypto and things like that. At your death, you may look more at those qualified assets uh, to see if you want to direct them to a charity directly, to a charitable remainder trust to get some benefit or stream of income for your kids during their life uh, or something like that. Um, any other questions so far? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if there was anything in particular else I wanted to talk about. I, I will say that all of these things other than the beneficiary designations, which are as easy as changing the beneficiary form uh, online or with a form with your IRA or your um, work 401k or 403b, all of the rest of them are things that you should go back and talk to your estate planning attorney about. Uh, you know, there are things that if you have questions about, certainly in regard to JDS, Sharon's going to be happy to talk to you about it. I'm happy to talk to you about how to phrase that best, how to make that conversation with your attorney as efficient as possible. Um, I know that all of my clients are always looking for our uh, work to be as efficient as we can make it. Uh, and so th those are things that you want to do with that. I will say that the one asset you want to be really careful about in terms of IRAs is any sort of Roth, uh, because those have different income tax issues. Uh, and again, if you're parsing through which asset is best to go to my child and which asset is best to go to the charity, the Roth is going to be a better asset for your child than it is for the charity. Uh, and so again, a lot of this is just looking at what's the best asset for this particular goal. Uh, and that's, that's really what you want to be thinking about is what's my goal. And then using your resources, your financial advisors and your uh, estate planning attorneys and accountants and the people at the organizations you want to help like Sharon uh, to help you figure out the most efficient, best way to get your goal done. Uh, let's see, Sharon, oh, that's in the chat. It's hard to see which is the question and which is the chat, but now I see. Um, other questions that anybody has about any of the stuff that we've talked about, I'm happy to try and uh, address them. Just looking to see if there's anything I wanted to make sure I talked about that I didn't. Um, I, I will say, Hopefully, your, your state planning attorney is asking, your financial advisor is asking you the question uh, about charitable giving. Uh, and it's something that a lot of people, again, as they're younger, aren't going to be that interested in necessarily. They've got too much going on, uh, but they may do something contingently. So, you know, look, if my kids aren't there, then yes, I want to give money to charity. Uh, and the next time that you're doing your planning and everything's a little more comfortable, again, you may move that from the sort of purely contingent to say, no, I wanna make sure I do something, some amount. And it's a process. So the fact that you didn't have charitable giving the last time you did your estate planning doesn't mean that this time isn't an appropriate time to really start looking at that. Uh, someone said, what's the best use of an inherited Roth? Um, that's usually better off going to your beneficiaries. It has the same 10 year rule. If you leave a $100,000 Roth to your child, they've gotta take all the money out of the Roth within that 10 year period but they're not going to pay any income taxes on it as they take it out. So they basically just get another 10 years of tax deferral uh, before they have to take that out and start investing it like regular money. Uh, so generally speaking, if you have a choice of different kinds of assets, the Roth is better off going to your kids uh, than, than other kinds of assets would be. Um, other questions, other things I can tell you guys or questions you had coming into this, uh, I'm happy to try and address or answer. Sharon, anything else uh, you can think of that you want to make sure that we touch on? Here, here, hold on a second. Hi. Um, 
that was great. Thank you. Um, you you hit all the all the high points. So thank you very much. Um, again, as Mark said many times, please reach out to him, to me, to Mitch, to whoever you want, and we'll get you to the right people to um, help you um, work on this. So I I I can help you from a JDS standpoint. I'm, I wouldn't be giving you legal advice. I would send you to Mark or someone else um, to give you that legal advice, but I, I certainly can um, can help point you in the right direction and give you some information. So um, thank you very much. Thank you to Mark. You're always so, so good at this and you're so approachable and make this um, really easy for people to understand. So we all appreciate that. And um, Thank you, Ariel. I think he's not on anymore, but um, thank you, Ariel, for um, setting us up. And um, thank you to everyone that participated. We will send out a, a recording and you are welcome to share that with colleagues, friends, whoever you want to with, with this information. Um, so please be in touch and thank you very much. <laughs>